Prosecutors and cops are sworn to protect and uphold the law and follow the rules. When they don't, when they lie, hide, and destroy evidence, and basically don't follow the rules, you get Stephen King and Warren Merrill tragedies of injustice. Innocent men who were wrongfully accused for sex crimes they did not commit. It can happen to any one of us. It can happen to you. Every year, there are hundreds of cases of prosecutorial misconduct, false arrest, and wrongful convictions that can happen in our justice system. Some prosecutors, police officials, and politicians with personal agendas call press conferences to launch inflammatory and usually false or grossly exaggerated claims about the importance of a given case, totally ignoring the facts in a rush to judgment. Examples are legion. Although the goal of every justice system is to provide fair and impartial judgments, more often than not, it doesn't work out that way. Either because of concealed evidence, people being framed, or corrupt law enforcement. Prosecutors are the most powerful players in the American criminal justice system. Their decisions, like whom to charge with a crime and what sentences to seek, have profound consequences. So why is it so hard to keep them from breaking the law or violating the Constitution? The short answer is that they are almost never held accountable for misconduct, even when it results in wrongful convictions. It's time for a new approach to ending this behavior. Federal oversight of prosecutors' offices that repeatedly ignore defendants' legal and constitutional rights. There is a successful model for this in the Justice Department's monitoring of police departments with histories of misconduct. Among the most serious prosecutorial violations is the withholding of evidence that could help a defendant prove his or her innocence or get a reduced sentence, a practice so widespread that one federal judge called it an epidemic. Under the 1963 landmark Supreme Court case Brady v. Maryland, Prosecutors are required to turn over any exculpatory evidence to a defendant that could materially affect a verdict or sentence. Yet in many district attorney's offices, the Brady Rule is considered nothing more than a suggestion, with prosecutors routinely holding back such evidence to win their cases. State courts often fail to hold prosecutors accountable, even when their wrongdoing is clear. And individual prosecutors are protected from civil lawsuits while criminal punishment is virtually unheard of. Money damages levied against a prosecutor's office could deter some misconduct, but the Supreme Court has made it extremely difficult for wrongfully convicted citizens to win such claims. This maddening situation has long resisted a solution. What would make good sense is to have the federal government step in to monitor some of the worst actors, increasing the chance of catching misconduct before it ruins people's lives. In this insider-exclusive Justice in America Network TV special, Justice in America, navigating America's legal, prison, and probation system, our news team goes behind the headlines to visit with Bill Herlock managing partner of Mueller Law, and his guest, Montclair, New Jersey, police officer, Garth Guthrie and Madeline Guthrie, Montclair, New Jersey, Neighborhood Development Corporation coordinator, to share how Bill, as well as his guests, helped those to navigate a complicated legal system to give them the best outcomes and opportunities for their future. Bill's goals are not only to get justice for his clients, but to make sure that everyone is treated with equal respect and dignity as guaranteed under the Constitution of the United States. His amazing courtroom skills and headline-grabbing success rate continue to provide his clients with the results they need and the results they deserve. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from New Jersey. It is my great pleasure to introduce Bill Herlock to the show. Welcome to the show, Bill. Thank you very much, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. 
Yeah, good to see you. You know, it was a nice cold morning in New Jersey. It's uh, tourist season in New Jersey, as we say. <laughs> so uh, you are the managing partner at Mueller Law Firm here in New Jersey. Correct. Um, what kind of cases, what is your typical practice you know, workload that you take on? We have a very diverse group of cases here at, uh, at the New York, New Jersey office. We have whistleblower cases under the False Claims Act whether it be federal or state. Uh, some cities like New York also have a False Claims Act, so we, we represent whistleblowers in that context. We also have a fair amount of commercial litigation as well. And we also do a lot of mass tort work on the plaintiff side, particularly here in New Jersey. You know, once a person gets a law degree, they can practice any type of law, but you have a tendency to practice this key Tom cases, these whistleblower cases, why do you take them on? Well, I'm a former federal prosecutor, so it allows me to still wear my prosecutorial hat in the private sector of, of the law business, if you will. And it's, these are cases that are very important to me. Um, I have a lot of respect for whistleblowers who come forward. As you know, it's not an easy task. And it's a privilege to represent the whistleblowers in that context. You um, provided for us, um, and the name of the show is Navigating the Legal System. Um, you provided us three cases that you have worked on among many in the past, where you have helped individuals who maybe couldn't afford a lawyer. And would you tell us a little bit about some of these cases, please? Absolutely. And, and it's a privilege, again, you know, to serve in that capacity. We do these cases pro bono which basically means that we pick up the, the fees and the costs for the individuals. The cases can range the gambit from uh, parole revocation hearings, could be expungements for individuals who are looking to basically turn their lives around and start afresh. So we've, we've actually had quite a few cases. We've been somewhat successful in that front. Um, it's kind of disturbing sometimes when you see what goes on in criminal proceedings. And again, as a former federal prosecutor, I have the advantage of seeing things through both lens, the prosecutorial lens and the defense counsel lens. And we've had a couple cases now, particularly when we're talking about parole revocation hearings. I'm appointed by the state of New Jersey to represent individuals who have asked for counsel in a parole revocation hearing. And a parole revocation for our audience is you're basically on probation, you're on parole, and sometimes parole officers cannot be the most friendly people in the whole world, right? It's a fair statement, yes. You intercede and provide information when maybe a parole officer has provided false information, correct? We, we've had instances, and, and, and it's um, really incumbent upon the uh, individuals themselves to ask for counsel. New Jersey is unique in that aspect in that they are afforded a court-appointed counsel in these proceedings. And I've had a couple of very interesting cases along the lines that you had just indicated. My very first case out of the box, I had been appointed by the state of New Jersey to represent an individual who the parole uh, group had said was violating his terms of his parole because he tested positive for controlled substance while in custody. Not entirely unheard of. It happens quite a bit. And in the initial intake of the case, when I had called over to get the file, there was a little bit of a back and forth in that I had said, well, this person tested positive. Yes, tested positive. And you tested, of course we tested. We wouldn't have done it otherwise, a revocation if we hadn't. Okay, I'd like a copy of the test results. Silence. So it took me a good two months before I finally got the test results. Yeah, meanwhile, where was your client? My client at that point is being detained, okay. pending. He's in custody. Once I got the results, I looked up controlled substances, negative. According to the test results, that he never tested positive. So again, there was some back and forth. I said, well, what are, you, what are we looking at here? That's what I usually try to do. And they said, well, your guy's going back. I said, for what basis? They said, tested positive for a controlled substance. I said, did you look at the test results? So why is he lying to you? That's a great question. And it, and it got even further because as we go to the hearing, which is basically a mini trial. So there's a hearing officer and then there's the state and then there's me with my client. We go in and there's an opening statements being made and I say to the hearing officer, I really am sorry, I've never done this before, it's highly irregular, I know, but I have to hand you a piece of paper, may I approach? I get pushed back from the hearing officer. She eventually lets me go up to the bench, hand the piece of paper with the test results. Why would the hearing officer push you back? 
because usually you're, you're afforded the ability to state, have your opening statements unimpeded by the other side. So for me to have objected was highly irregular in that proceeding. Handed up the piece of paper, read test results negative. Hearing officer hands it to the state representative, has the state representative read it into the record, and the case was dismissed. Now, in a case like this, your client was detained in custody for two, three months, whatever, okay? He may have been trying to put his life back together. Um, he may have had a job um, because he gets rearrested falsely. Um, do you, is there any civil rights violations here that you have pursued on behalf of people like that because they now have an extra loss? Yeah, that's an, a, an excellent question. And in that context, no, because under the, the way that the system is set up, unfortunately, you don't necessarily have that recourse available to you. And you mean because a probation officer lied, and that's the bottom line, um, and he harmed you, he or she harmed you you know, the, the parolee, they have no recourse against them. They, they do have recourse in other contexts. So they could file a suit, uh, a civil suit perhaps, if they were so inclined. Oftentimes, though, Steve, these individuals don't want any further... Extra problems. Correct. And they, they want to extricate themselves from the system as much as possible. We had another case, if, if you want me to... Sure, you had one, cha uh, somebody changed his home address. Yes, and we had another parole revocation hearing where the individual was going to be sent back because he allegedly changed his address without notifying the state. Was that true? No, not at all. Why did they make that claim? A lot of the times you see that um, claims are made not necessarily based on the facts, but based on perceptions. And what we had here was an instance where I went and interviewed his mom because he still lived at home, got his mail for his bank statements, electric bills, utilities, what have you, and they all still had the address on there. The second part of that case was he was also being revoked because he was seen in a, quote, shooting position by a police officer. Okay, what does that mean exactly? That, well, it's, it becomes very interesting. Do, does that person have to have a gun in their hand or just in a shooting position? Well, we, when, we, when we went back and forth on the stand, when I put the officer on at the hearing, I said, you know, your report here says that you, you saw this individual in a shooting position. Yes. Can you show me what, what does it mean again? Well, and, I, and I, I had him stand up and I said, well, can you show me? And he got up and he stood up and he went like this. Did he have a weapon in his hand? That's the million dollar question. So the follow up was, did you see my client with a weapon? I saw him in a shooting position. That's not the question I asked. <laughs> did you see a weapon? And we did this little dance. And finally, I had to go to the hearing officer and say, can you please have the gentleman answer my question now? Did you see a wep Did you see my client with a weapon? So the, so the parole officer refused to answer the question. This was actually a police officer who was testifying on behalf of the state through the parole. And when I said, "Did you did you see a weapon?" No, I did not. And then that case was dismissed. Now the the change of address part of that, Steve, they had said he changed his address because he stayed at his girlfriend's house for a Friday and a Saturday night and hadn't reported it. That's the quote change of it. Yeah, under the terms of his parole, was he required to call in every night? No. Okay, so that's kind of irrelevant, isn't it? Completely. Yeah. <laughs> so let me ask you this. Um, it seems to me that, uh, that parole officers in these two cases are getting away with murder. I mean, nothing happens to them, do they? In those contexts, nothing further was, uh, there was no further follow-up. Now, thank goodness these individuals who had been in the system knew better to ask for a court appointed attorney yeah. and that we were able to assist them. Although sometimes if you get a court appointed attorney, they don't necessarily follow through to the level that we do, quite frankly. And we were very, very vigilant in the way we prosecute these cases. Why is this a cause for you? I uh, became a lawyer, not to, to you know, sound too cliche, to help people, really. And these are some people that really, you know, need some serious legal representation. So for me, this is a, a, is a very important aspect, as are the expungements that we handle. Because I think, uh, is it most states right now, or is there a federal law that says that an employer cannot discriminate against you 
if you have a state or federal conviction. Is that correct? It, it is depending on the jurisdiction. Okay. Now, New Jersey is very progressive in many ways, not the least of which is the way we handle our expungement laws. Thank goodness. Because, uh, and I'm a big proponent in this, I serve on some very, uh, very prominent boards that uh, National Youth Recovery Foundation, and basically these are individuals who have been through a uh, treatment program and they've successfully graduated from that program. And now they're trying to get into the workforce and really turn things around. The problem that they have, though, is that because of these records, if you will, it's hard for them to get employment. But that gets back to my question again. You know, I mean, if you have a conviction, criminal conviction, supposedly, as I understand it, that can't be held against you when you're applying for a job. You cannot be just randomly discriminated. In fact, I think, was it maybe about a year ago, they took off the box on a job application, have you ever been convicted of a felony? Correct. Okay, that's all. Yeah. That kind of says that you can't, they, the employer really can't consider it as the one means for not hiring you. So when we're talking about getting a job and you have a criminal record, how are employers able to do this? Yeah, and it, it depends on the context too, because it depends on the job. So like for me as a lawyer, when I have to go through a character and fitness examination as part of my bar, right? Those are still quote fair game. And it depends too on the level of, of, um, of crime. So if you've got you know, a high level felony, that wouldn't necessarily be eligible for expungement and there, that those types of issues are still fair game depending on the nature of the employment. So, you know, if you have a, an accountant or a lawyer and a fiduciary responsibility with a client or with a prospective job application, those would still be fair game under the law, even as it is now. So not everything is covered. So how successful are you with getting expungements for folks and under what conditions? Are they usually drug-related, lesser drug-related crimes? Many of them, unfortunately, are drug-related crimes. Um, like possession? Or possession, possession with an intent. Not being El Chapo or anything like that. Exactly right. Yes, that's very true. Yeah, so, and but once we're able to do that and get those records sealed, now they don't necessarily report any of that on the application going forward, and it allows them now to take the next step in turning their lives around and getting gainful employment. Do you, are you, do any of these people keep in touch with you after you've helped them? They have actually, and we've had a lot of success stories. So I'm, I'm happy to report. Are there other lawyers like you that take on these court appointed cases? There are. We have a very nice network um, of colleagues that um, have specialties in, in different areas. And you're going to m meet some of my colleagues who are in the community who I work very closely with who have this network through me. So I handle criminal expungements. I've got another lawyer that is very close with me who handles immigration type of issues. We've got another lawyer in the group who may handle health benefit issues for those who navigate through the health benefit programs here in the state of New Jersey and elsewhere. So we have a nice network of, of people with different specialties that we're able to tap into to help the community. Um, two of the people you mentioned, uh, one of them is a police officer in the Montclair, New Jersey Police Department, right? Officer Garth Guthrie right. and his wife, Madeline Guthrie, who I understand she is with the Neighborhood Development Corporation. That is correct. Is and that helping people get jobs? Yes. And they've both done a wonderful job for our, a wonderful job for our community here in Montclair in helping kids, young adults, seniors, you know, people all along the spectrum. And it's a privilege and an honor for me to work with both of them. All right, we have them here today, fortunately. So let's bring them on right now. It is my great pleasure to introduce Garth and Madeline Guthrie. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank, Thank you. Guys. Garth, you are on the Montclair, New Jersey Police Department, right? Yes, I am. What do you do there? I work in the Community Service Bureau, which um, pretty much um, go out and um, talk to business owners and different clients, different residents about the area and what the needs and what the needs are. It's a very, very nice community development and relationship, isn't it? Yeah. How big is the town of Montclair? How many people are in it, approximately? It's approximately 30, 39,000. This old small town America. Yeah, 6.6 6 square miles. And you work with your husband in an organization called Reaching Out Montclair, which you both founded, correct? Yes. What exactly do you do as a police officer and a social worker 
with Montclair citizens and businesses? Well, we do various of things. We uh, provide clothing, furniture, um, donated stuff. Um, also, we helped out with the immigration cases. Um, with Mr. Herlock, actually helps out with that. Um, we also provide meals, um, shelter. It's various of things that we do for the families that they're in need in Montclair. Well, you're to be congratulated for that. But you know, here's a big question. A lot of people can do what you do, but they don't. So why do you do what you do? I am personally a cancer survivor. So I felt that I was given a chance, so I needed to give somebody else a chance. So, and my husband also. He's actually the one who got me into it. Oh, really? Yes. And um, what? give me some examples of folks that you have helped in the community and what you've done. See residents, some residents having difficulty finding jobs, or even finding a place to live. So therefore, you know, I see the, the, Mr. Herlock um, helped with the expungement for some cases because I find that quite a few of the resident that I come in contact with have some criminal past that prohibit them from even have gainful employment. And you mentioned something about immigrants. Yes. How are you helping some of the immigrants here? Well, I deal with a lot of females who come into this country um, illegally, unfortunately, but um, they're being abused. They have no way of communication back and forth, domestic violence, so I translate for them. And I also make sure that um, they're being taken care of because they think they have no rights due to their status. How do they get in touch with you? We do a lot of events in town. So we collect coats and um, meals, furniture. So on the events, I get to mingle with all the families and I make them feel welcome. We both do. And they feel safe. So that's the reason they come, you know. Yeah. What do you want to say to the citizens of Montclair to let them know, because this is going to be on national TV, let them know that you're here to help them and also you work with Bill uh, to help them with some of their legal problems? I just want to let them know that if they need any type of legal service or any help in that regard and they're thinking about because of their financial um, position, they're not able to do so. Don't hesitate to, but because as Bill said in the past before, that it's best to seek legal counseling for, for any litigation or any m criminal matters you're, you're involved in, that, and that you'll find, they will find a way to help you in some regard. On my behalf for the immigrants, they, they're safe. They're safe to come to us. Um, along with Mr. Herlock and his colleagues who have helped us a whole lot. Um, they, they can come to us and the community to help out, to help out because there's a lot of people in the community that needs help. They need assistance. Um, people think because it's Montclair, it's a, a you know, pretty much upscale, wealthy uh, town. There's no need. There is need. There is need. How do they get in touch with you? Most of them have my personal so, yes. Yeah, so you don't have like a storefront? No, we don't. Okay. And you have, you can rely on a lot of organizations to help you out, like provide food or provide Absolutely. housing, that sort of thing? Absolutely. We work along together with Tony's Kitchen. Um, we work um, with the YMCA, the Montclair Township, a lot of organizations. How, how, mu how much time every month or week do you devote to this? We don't stop. We don't stop. No. Okay. Whenever it's a need, we. Um, there's been many of occasions that um, Mr. Herlock have called that we have homeless, yeah. and we just do what we have to do. And, and the thing that we can we can depend on Mr. Herlock at any time. Absolutely. At any time we call, he's right there. To pick up the phone, and he's always ready to help. Well, you know, I'm very impressed. You know, I'm very impressed. Um, so they can get a hold of you guys through Bill. Through his office. Through his office, or call us direct through our personal. Well, they don't have that, but I think Mr. Herlight can do a, yeah, yeah. an amazing job to basically get in touch with us. Okay, terrific. He can he make that happen for sure. Well, I want to thank you for coming in on this Sunday morning, <laughs> early, yeah. cold, right? Yes. Yeah. And I really respect what you're doing. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Nice. 
a lot of people claim that they are accused of crimes they never did. So you hear people often say, what about my civil rights? What are these civil rights? Yeah. And it, again, it depends on the jurisdiction. And it, it's a fair question. And, um, you know, there's that old joke that prisons are filled with innocent people. And that's part of the context, right? And these civil rights are very important and near and dear, which is exactly why the system is set up the way it is, you know, from the beginning. So you have remedies available to you if you have been wrongfully charged or wrongfully incarcerated. That's from the legal perspective. Now, I tell clients this all the time, Steve, that there's the legal aspect and then there's the practical side. And unfortunately, while you do have those rights under the legal side, on a practical level, many individuals don't want to go there because they want to disengage as quickly and painlessly as possible from the system. Let me ask you the question when we're talking about the probation officers who basically lied and had these people incarcerated for a tempor temporary period of time. Do they retain the same parole officer? It, and not to give you the, what we call a lawyerly answer, it depends. Yeah. If they petition to have a different officer t assigned to them, that, that is something that's available. Often they don't, though. Yeah. What advice do you have to people who have been wrongfully accused of anything, you know, parole violation, whatever? What should you do first? It's an excellent question. And I tell everyone this, that what you really need to do is try to obtain counsel, whether you can do it through your own financial means, unfortunately many people can't, whether you know a friend of somebody who, who is an attorney, or if you go through the court-appointed system, you really do need an attorney to navigate. And how would you go through the court-appointed system? Basically, once, you're, once these charges come against you, particularly, let's say, a parole revocation hearing, you have the opportunity, when you are presented with the charge, to ask for court-appointed counsel in the state of New Jersey. Are there enough attorneys to go around that your needs will be met in a relatively short period of time? Yes. However, each attorney, like most in any profession, they're going to approach something differently. We take these cases very seriously here. We put a lot of time and attention into them. And we, go that we, we want to make sure that we're giving the right representation to the individuals. If you're going to tell people one thing that they shouldn't do, what is that? One, that's an excellent question. I would tell people what you shouldn't do is try to go it alone. A lot of people think that they've been in the system before, they can handle themselves. Not a good idea. You need somebody, you need a lawyer who knows this area of the law. Okay, and one final question. You, you, do you take every case that comes to you as a court-appointed lawyer, or do you select the cases that you want to choose? I take whatever I, uh, the court sends to me. I, I definitely take that very seriously, and I take those cases. Okay, and in your regular business, you know, your regular, how do you select clients? We are very fortunate. We have a, a very good reputation in the various areas that we practice in, so we get a lot of uh, referrals from word of mouth. We're also involved in several organizations that center on the particular areas of law that we practice. All right, very good. I want to thank you for being on the show. Thank you for the opportunity, Steve. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at insiderexclusive.com.